and we are live. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Gianluca Torregrossa, and uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, here today together with Dr. John Pascas and Dr. David Taggart, uh, the uh, backbone and uh, uh, the origin, uh, the mentors uh, and founders of the International Coronary Congress uh, and of the International Society of Coronary Artery Surgery. Today with me, there will be, uh, it's here also Shana Friedman, Executive Director of Nursing Operation and Cardiac Service uh, at Mount Sinai, and uh, Richard Vitali, uh, uh, one of the most senior physician assistant, uh, incredible skilled uh, uh, endoradial harvester and, and endovein harvester and great uh, uh, table set assistant. Today, we are here as the organizing committee of uh, the uh, International Coronary Congress 2023 that will be host uh, in New York City from the 1st to the 3rd of December 2023. So in less than 30 days, uh, we will all meet in New York City to attend now the ninth edition of the most important and respected uh, uh, coronary surgical uh, uh, meeting uh, in the world. So before starting, and the concept behind uh, this, this live talk today is just presenting to you and users uh, the, 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 the program, have feedback from you, and uh, uh, um, we want to hear where you are looking us from and uh, uh, how can we make sure that we deliver exactly in the content uh, what you expect uh, from the meeting. On top of it, I always believe that uh, uh, passing through uh, the meeting agenda in advance allow you to perfectly shape your experience uh, according to what you are looking for from this meeting and make sure that you are well aware of all of the difficult different sessions that are concurrently happening during these three days dedicated for coronary surgery. I've said that I want to start with some historical background and I will ask both uh, Dr. John Pascas and Dr. David Taggart, uh, who is uh, currently in Sydney and it's uh, in, a, in a very difficult time zone. So Dr. Taggart, thank you for being here. It's probably midnight or one o'clock in the morning. It's, <clears throat> it's not an easy time zone for me either, but yours is way worse. So uh, a lot of respect. But I want to start with Dr. John Pascas and Dr. David Taggart asking them, this is the ninth edition of the International Coronary Congress. How did we get here? What was the beginning? When did you guys have the original idea of, of founding International Coronary Congress? How did we move and uh, what, what happened in between? Dr. Pascas. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Gianluca, Dr. Taggart, uh, Richard Vitali, and Shauna Freeman. We're really happy to have the whole executive uh, team here um, on the call, uh, missing only uh, Mario Gaudino, who's at AHA this morning presenting. Um, Thank you all for being here, and it's exciting to discuss this year's meeting. It is the ninth, as you pointed out, Dr. Torregrosa, uh, and it has evolved uh, over time. Uh, we, we recognized, we being David Taggart and myself, uh, back in the 2013-2014 era, that the major national and international meetings were really not focused very much on coronary surgery at all. They focused on a lot of other interesting topics within the broader field of cardiothoracic surgery, but cor coronary bypass was largely um, uh, ignored. Uh, and we felt that was wrong uh, since most surgeons spent most of their time uh, taking care of coronary patients and most human beings will die of coronary artery disease. After all, we are all surgeons or surgical partners and we devote our attention and our efforts, our professional goal uh, to using surgical skill uh, to combat uh, the number one killer of human beings, which is coronary artery disease. So we thought that an international meeting, uh, one that leveraged the expertise and the different viewpoints of the surgical communities in different countries, uh, could elevate and promote the quality of, of care for coronary bypass and coronary surgery patients in general um, around the world. Uh, frankly, David Taggart uh, had uh, created a very interesting a uh, nearly annual master class in off-pump bypass at Oxford. And our Japanese colleagues had created the Japanese Association for Coronary Artery Surgery um, more than a decade earlier. 
um, all in response to uh, the decline in the number of coronary cases uh, being done, uh, competition from um, stents, uh, and um, what we felt was a stagnation in the progress being made to improve uh, coronary surgery. Uh, so we believe that creating um, an international annual meeting um, focused solely on coronary surgery would have a role and a benefit uh, to uh, patients and to our profession. Uh, and it's been a joy uh, to partner with uh, David Taggart uh, and, uh, and everyone on this screen uh, to bring this year's program to fruition. Dr. Taggart, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the journey. If you remember all of the nine steps, uh, all of the nine uh, events, uh, the concept is always uh, United States one year and uh, one year abroad. Where did we pass through and uh, what is expecting ahead? Dr. Taggart. So I, I hope you can hear me because my connection to you from Sydney does not look great. Can you hear me? Very yeah. well. Great. So I think with um, it's been a great priv privilege and pleasure for me to work with John Puskas now for over a decade, both discussing off-pump coronary surgery, the use of the best way to use or utilize cabbage in terms of its conduct, especially with regards to multiple arterial grafts. I met, a, a, as I've said, a, in a meeting in Sydney, and we've spent a lot of today discussing this very issue. And there's great enthusiasm in Australia for changing the way we do coronary artery surgery. I think, um, you know, as we progress this meeting, and you may be aware that next year, the 10th meeting will be in London, in the UK. And I think it's fantastic that we have Richard Vidali and Sean, Sean of Friedman to help us progress the program just from strictly the surgical perspective of coronary artery revascularization into a wider field. So I think every year we make more progress than we had before. I think it's interesting in Sydney to hear the enthusiasm amongst the cardiologists here to see more coronary artery surgery and to have more of a balance of what we should be doing to patients, especially <laughs> led by the heart team. So I hope you heard most of that, but um, I think the meeting in New York is without question the most comprehensive meeting of coronary artery surgery at this point worldwide. We do a program that is definitely not matched by AATS or STS or EX, but to be fair, they're all trying to address the same question. But I think um, with our expert faculty and the breadth of what we're trying to cover, not just from the surgical perspective, but from the PA and our nursing colleagues, I think we really are creating something pretty special. But Fantastic. To, to uh, answer directly, uh, Gianluca, your question about uh, the history, um, David and I uh, held the first International Coronary Congress um, in uh, 2015, um, here in the United States, uh, in New York, in Times Square at the Marriott Marquis, where this year's meeting will be held. Um, when we were delighted to discover that we had attendees from over 30 different countries attend. Uh, the next year, 2016, was, he was held in New Delhi, hosted by Naresh Trehan. Um, and we had over 2,000 attendees uh, at a wonderful um, uh lavish uh, hotel conference facility. Yes. 2017 was back in New York, uh, very well uh, attended again. 2018, we held in conjunction with the China Heart Congress um, in Beijing, uh, and about 5,000 uh, uh, people attended at that meeting. Uh, the following year, we were back in New York and had attendance from about 45 different countries. Uh, the following year, of course, was COVID. The next year we had a hybrid event uh, and in 2022, uh, just last year, uh, we had a wonderful meeting in Tokyo uh, organized by uh, Hiro Arai and his colleagues um, from Japan. Uh, this year we're back in New York and as uh, Dr. Tagger pointed out, um, the 10th uh, anniversary meeting will be held in London uh, at the Queen Elizabeth uh, Center across the street from Westminster Abbey. Uh, in December of 2024. 
But of course, we're here to talk about the 2023 meeting. And with us is Richard Vitale and, and uh, Shauna Friedman. They represent the new faces um, on the screen and, and, and in the International Coronary Congress organizing uh, uh, top flight uh, curriculum uh, for uh, surgical assistants and uh, cardiovascular nurses and intensive care perioperative uh, care providers of all kinds, because we've come to recognize that excellence in outcomes for patients is obviously more than just what the surgeon thinks and does, uh, but rather it's the operative team and especially the perioperative team uh, that can make the difference between good and great uh, outcomes uh, for patients. I agree completely, and uh, I think that uh, the, the the most important concept uh, behind this uh, this uh, organization is one uh, the international aspects has been maintained throughout this year by moving the meeting uh, from the United States into separate session or separate countries and different countries. We want to bring uh, what we believe uh, it's the knowledge that you can acquire by by attending our meeting directly to your own house. And we hope uh, to keep this journey and maybe include even South America or the area that we have not been yet in the future years. Secondly, I think that the great value is not only a program dedicated for surgeons, but also a program dedicated for who are the, all of the other elements, all of the other persons, all of the other expertise that uh, are surrounding the care for patients with coronary artery disease, and in particular, the nurses and uh, the uh, physician assistant. Richard, give us uh, your elevator pitch. You have been involved very uh, early on. Uh, you have organized incredible training session. People were coming and learning directly from you and the other expert how to take an endoscopic vein, how to harvest an endoscopic radial. And then from a technical, you guys have grown into a pure core curriculum of, of, of activities. So uh, tell us a little bit your journey with International Coronary Congress and how you're moving forward and what to expect for PA. And then we will ask Shauna for nurses at the current meeting. Thank you, Gianluca. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to the executive committee to, for putting together this program. And uh, thanks for everyone to be spending Saturday morning here uh, with us discussing this wonderful program. Um, so I, I've been involved with the ICC now for a number of years. And uh, as Dr. Taggart had stated, um, this conference was initially designed and continues to make changes towards the advances in coronary surgery and the changes in coronary surgery. And over the number of years that I've been involved in coronary surgery, our patients have changed so much. The patients that we see in the operating room, the medications that they're on, all these different aspects that affect our plan in surgery. And we've been uh, able, and thousands of others of people have been able to make changes to afford those wonderful outcomes that we've always expected. Um, th this conference has always highlighted and made uh, advances within uh, changes in the surgical field in which uh, we are all involved in. But now, as we've been discussing for the past few years, um, the impact of this change of this patient population has great impacts to the care of this patient, both before and after surgery. And would it be, wouldn't it be a wonderful opportunity to bring the whole team together in this conference? Mm -hmm. Everyone that cares for the patient before, during, and after surgery and create an educational opportunity that highlights the advances in which we have in surgery, as well as how we care for the patients before and after. And we've been very fortunate to put together an amazing team. Uh, the co-directors that are involved in this advances program are top-notch in their field, uh, wonderful clinicians, incredible educators, and are truly passionate with uh, their field. And it's just a wonderful uh, time and speaking with them and designing this two-day program that touches on the entire aspect of before and after surgery. Uh, so uh, Shauna Friedman, who's on our call today, uh, has been instrumental in advancing this program and creating uh, the opportunities on the nursing aspect, 
Dr. Natalia Girardi uh, from Wild Cornell Medical Center, same uh, from the anesthesia standpoint, critical care, the perioperative care of the patient, and Zareen Parvez, who is our other co-director, is a physician assistant with many years of uh, involvement in cardiac surgery, as well as in training and education and advancing what we do. Um, so we're very excited uh, for Saturday and Sunday. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 6 a.m., we have a full program where it will take us from all aspects of the perioperative care of the patient. Uh, we also have some wonderful hands-on sessions. So not only do you see this uh, up on the screen and discuss during the presentation, but we'll have an opportunity to go out and actually put our hands on uh, some of these technologies. Um, in addition, there are some wonderful presentations which will highlight some of the difficulties that we have in the perioperative care of the patient and offer wonderful solutions uh, to that end. Fantastic. Shauna, floor is Hi. yours. Tell us <laughs> why every nurse uh, of uh, New York, uh, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania should uh, go and hook up a train uh, and uh, reach uh, Times Square and uh, come uh, to the International Coloring Congress uh, that day. What they should expect, uh, how they will be uh, uh, welcoming, uh, what is uh, the concept behind having nurses uh, at this meeting? Yeah. Well, good, oh, good morning, everyone. And I just want to say thank you. This is my first year being involved in the ICC, and I am very grateful to be here and to help with Rich Vitale and these great surgeons to develop a nursing program. And nurses are involved in the pre, intra, and post. Um, this year, we just focus mostly on the post as it relates to intensive care. There is also um, pharmacy involvement as well as um, critical care attendings which are the th and nurse practitioners, which are the four disciplines really in the post-operative phase that run the ICU after the surgeons have done their amazing work in the OR. And not only did we focus on the clinical aspects of what individual nurses do for their individual patients, we also focused on how the group as a team in the unit functions together, comes up with standards in how we develop and train our nurses to become excellent cardiovascular ICU nurses who really take the patient from the OR with the conjunction of our critical care attendings, our pharmacists, and our nurse practitioners, and really delve into specific areas of that care and come and develop plans that take our patients to discharge and home and back to their healthy lives. Fantastic. Well explained. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it's incredible. And I think it's a very important element, uh, Shauna, your presence here and uh, Richard, like the fact as you were highlighting, uh, uh, outcomes of CAB do, uh, do not uh, uh, only uh, uh, happen because of a uh, perfect executed surgery, but because we all work together and we, we care for our patients. So <clears throat> Dr. Pascas, uh, we go now to the granularity, to the details uh, of, uh, of the program itself. Uh, and uh, we exchange uh, to here this uh, uh, page that is uh, currently stream uh, from my computer by going uh, in uh, internationalcoronarycongress.com. And I uh, really invite uh, all of you who are uh, watching us to spend some time uh, and uh, go to the website. Uh, uh, when you are there, please join ISCAS, the International Society of Coronary Artery Surgery, and then uh, spend some time so with, the with, with the agenda of, of, of the meeting uh, to make sure to really tailor around your needs or what you like to see the meeting itself. Dr. Pascas, tell us a little bit what is the big theme of the ICC 2023? What we will, uh, uh, what do you want to deliver? What are the major theme of Friday and uh, Saturday and Sunday? And uh, we can go through some of the granular detail of uh, details of of, of each uh, of each session, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Gianluca, and thanks to Richard and Shana. Um, the uh, the meeting this year really at, uh, will address many themes within coronary surgery, all of them designed to elevate the quality 
of surgical and perioperative care that we provide to patients with coronary artery disease. Uh, and, and I think we should be clear, everybody who attends is entitled to walk between the several rooms uh, and, and uh, pick and choose uh, what they want to hear uh, and um, in, in each of the rooms. They're all physically very close together so that the so-called plenary sessions in Salon 1 and 3 are very close to Salon 2 and to the Lyceum and Juilliard complexes. These are literally just a few steps away from each other. So that if there's something you really want to learn about endoscopic radial harvest in one room, and then you want to hear about, um, uh, you know, medications used in the perioperative setting, and then you'd like to talk about uh, all arterial bypass grafting and some of the, uh, the the techniques for that, these may be going on in, in different rooms, uh, literally a few steps away from each other. So we, we look to see that um, it's not just uh, parallel uh, um, curricula that are being offered for surgeons residents, fellows, nurses, and physicians' assistants, but rather <clears throat> a menu uh, of, of uh, educational opportunity that everybody can sample uh, at any time, uh, moving within these very closely uh, uh, located uh, uh, presentation rooms. Um, with that, I, I then would draw your attention to, to session one, where we typically begin each of the, our, our annual meetings with a summary of the evidence that supports the performance of coronary bypass surgery, uh, diving into um, the particular patient subgroups that benefit from coronary surgery um, and um, some of the controversial topics. Uh, but typically, um, multivessel and left main disease patients um, are those that benefit greatly uh, from coronary surgery. And you can see that we have literally world experts addressing each of these topics. Professor Taggart is the only uh, tenured professor of cardiac surgery at Oxford University, and we'll discuss in the opening um, presentation of our opening session, the role of coronary surgery in multivessel disease patients. Dr. Sabic, uh, everyone knows, is uh, going to address the issue of left main disease. And Michael Farku may not be known to all the surgeons uh, who are listening to our webinar this morning, but he is the first author of the Freedom Trial. Uh, the trial that he and Dr. Um, Valentin Fuster conducted now about eight years ago, randomizing patients with diabetes to have coronary bypass surgery versus PCI, and which was strikingly positive in favor of coronary bypass. It is that fundamentally, um, it's fundamentally that trial that drives referral of diabetic patients to coronary surgery rather than multivessel PCI. And as more and more of the Western population develops type two diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, this is a driver uh, for uh, surgical referrals um, uh, really throughout the world. Moreover, uh, the fact that many of our patients, in fact, a majority of our patients now are diabetic, but that impacts our perioperative care for, for uh, intensive care and of course our nursing care as well. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy uh, over uh, the comparison of cabbage versus PCI within clinical trials and how much of the statistical uh, difference may hinge upon the definition of perioperative myocardial infarction. Uh, and this is an arbitrary definition. Uh, when perioperative myocardial infarction is removed from these trials, typically cabbage outperforms PCI even more. And I think that's a, a realization that deserves a separate uh, discussion. Uh, Tom Schwann is uh, a surgeon um, presently now leading the Beaumont uh, program in um, uh, Detroit, um, uh, but who, who has uh, had a decades-long experience in uh, arterial grafting uh, and is going to talk about the evidence base for that. Uh, so you can see it's, it's um, world leaders addressing important topics in this opening session, and you'll see that that fundamentally continues through all of the sessions uh, at the ICC. Uh, even as we introduce um, uh, some younger, uh, new, um, and up-and-coming uh, uh, surgical stars, uh, you know, really from around the world. Uh, Dr. Taggart, maybe you'd discuss these hot topics in coronary surgery. Well, thank you. We had a very interesting debate in Sydney today with some very eminent cardiologists about the role of cavity and PCI in multivessel disease specifically. But I think the advantage of what we're doing just now is I think, as Richard Vitale said, is the extension of the program to recognize 
how coronary surgery really is a team approach. It's not simply the surgeon in the operating room, but it's the nursing team. It's the special care practitioners in terms of harvesting conduit. And I think Dr. Engelman, in giving us very good advice how we need to expand the program into how we don't just do the surgery, but how we also fast track recovery. So I think the program each year is expanding. And we now have Dr. Shauna Freeman, and she's now telling us about the importance of how the nursing team contribute to what we're doing. So I think holistically, it makes the program much more relevant to the whole team involved in the care of patients undergoing coronary surgery. Because in the first few years, we concentrated only on specific surgical aspects, which was fine at the time. But the recognition that we, we are part of a bigger team is becoming more relevant each year. Terrific. Um, these hot topics in uh, coronary surgery 2023 will focus uh, again involving our cardiology colleagues what is the future of non-surgical management of coronary disease? We're seeing a lot of attention paid in not just the medical literature, but in the media uh, about the impact of medication on um, management of hyperlipidemia and even obesity. Um, there are new medicines uh, every year coming out uh, that help uh, prevent um, uh, acute uh, cardiac events in the non-surgical patient. Uh, and so an update on that is important uh, for our uh, yes. entire attendees. Um, <clears throat> Mario Gaudino uh, is uh, among the most w widely published um, uh, cardiac surgeons on the planet and is going to talk about um, trends in co coronary surgery research, not cardiac surgery research, but coronary surgery research. Um, and then uh, Gianluca himself, uh, Dr. Torgosa will address coronary surgery innovation he has been an, an extraordinarily innovative robotic and minimally invasive and all arterial uh, coronary surgeon. Um, uh, I take some pride in his achievements having uh, had the privilege of helping to train him. Um, now, Steve Freems from Toronto will discuss the interpretation and uh, uh, misinterpretation of the ischemia trial <clears throat> and how that applies to our understanding of coronary disease. And the European and uh, U.S. guidelines will be addressed by Patrick Myers, from, uh, who is um, Secretary General of, of EACTS. Um, now, cabbage in women is a terribly important uh, area. Uh, as we all know, um, not only do women represent a little more than half of the human population, but coronary disease is the major killer of women, not just men. And yet, patients who are female tend to do meaningfully less well after coronary surgery than male patients. And that's a, a, a real opportunity for improvement. We need to understand why that is <clears throat> and what can we do to improve it. So we're excited about this session. We think it's terribly important. Uh, you'll see uh, that that's moderated by uh, Yajmi Adav from the UK, Jennifer Lawton from Johns Hopkins and James Tatoulis to provide the elder statesman uh, view uh, uh, from Australia. Uh, but you note that all that many of the speakers are women addressing the topic of um, uh, outcomes and techniques uh, for coronary surgery in <coughs> the female patient. Uh, and then we go to luncheon, uh, where there are uh, um, interesting opportunities uh, to move between um, different uh, luncheon opportunities supported by different um, industry sponsors uh, and as they uh, they will have their own uh, speakers uh, specifically addressing uh, the use of their technologies to improve outcomes in coronary surgery patients. So it's more than just a free lunch. Um, it's an opportunity to learn um, uh, from uh, some of the best uh, speakers uh, in specific uh, areas um, uh, related to technology uh, for coronary surgery patients. Uh, and then I'm very excited to see um, the, the afternoon session uh, that you've got there in the Juilliard complex mm -hmm. includes the ICC Training Academy. Um, now, that this is a new creation this year. So if you want to think about a theme for this year, it's um, hands-on learning. We want uh, surgeons, um, surgical fellows, surgical residents, uh, PAs and MPs in the operating room to leave uh, 
New York this year after the ICC with a skill that they didn't have when they arrived. And we want them to go home to wherever they came from, whether that's you know as far away as New Jersey or as far away as Thailand, uh, and use um, uh, that tech, that, that new skill uh, to improve the quality of care uh, for their coronary patients. And uh, Gianluca Torregrosa has been absolutely instrumental in developing this mm. training academy. Uh, so Gianluca, please tell us about your uh, curriculum here, uh, the industry sponsorship for it, and, and what an attendee can uh, expect to learn or have an opportunity to learn. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Pascas. And yes, the concept behind uh, this uh, academy was, as you were uh, pointing out, a real deep dive, very uh, uh, technical oriented uh, uh, um, area and session where mostly residents, uh, but are also attending, uh, can uh, have an understanding of what are the technologies that we all discuss about by touching them, by interacting with them, and by having one of the experienced surgeons being able to be at the bedside or at the table side of these small tables where we want to have three or four <coughs> residents for, for, for each one of them at each time with some senior leader capable of explaining to them the nuances of this technology. Uh, we wanted to have a dedicated session for the off-pump technique that was supported by Medtronic, another session about uh, hemostatic agent and uh, uh, wound closure supported by Ethicon, and then uh, two more sessions, one about how to use uh, a transit time flow meters uh, during your coronary artery bypass graft and grafting supported by Medistem, and finally, how to perform a maze uh, if you have uh, a concomitant maze of if you have a patient that needs bypass and has atrial fibrillation, how to clip the left atrial appendage and, and express and explain to everyone uh, around the world the real technical nuances, the real technical aspects of this type uh, of surgery. And uh, we well, we go back uh, uh, to what is now the afternoon or the uh, uh, early afternoon for the, uh, uh, um, the still for the day of Friday of, uh, of the International Coronary Congress. Dr. Uh, Dr. Taggart, tell us a little bit about uh, the concurrent session. We have uh, in the afternoon uh, established abstract session uh, concurrently to some uh, uh, major session uh, in uh, in uh, in the main uh, in in the main room uh, yes this is always a kind of um tension between what's happening at the main plenary sessions and what else we're trying to support so this year we had almost 70 absolutely superb abstracts submitted so those that continues to increase every year and we had to fit in, the problem for us was what can be be presented at a co-plenary session and what to accommodate other speakers would now be e-poster presentations. So we're trying to, as ever in meetings, trying to find the area between how we make sure that the abstract submitted get full attention as possible and also those that cannot be presented at the plenary sessions will still be presented as e-posters. So we've made a big effort this year to make sure that for these abstract presentations and including the e-posters presentations, that we've got serious clinicians making sure that they're at these meetings. So, for instance, on the Saturday and Sunday morning, we have quick fire abstract sessions. So that we're trying to give as much advertisement as we can to all of these different areas of what people are doing throughout the world in all areas of coronary artery surgery. And the real problem we have is what we wanted to do was to give as much time as possible to each abstract or e-poster, but equally so, we have to be very conscious of the time that's available to do that. Correct. So we will have this concurrent session in the afternoon uh, together in parallel with ab abstract session. Yes. 
we will have a concurrent coronary master class uh, with a multi arterial and all arterial that uh, uh, does a real uh, uh, wants really to present all of the technical aspects uh, of multi arterial bypass grafting uh, with all of the techniques uh, to perform uh, uh, an aortic uh, or uh, complex uh, um, um, bypass grafting in Y, T, and uh, I sequential grafting. We will uh, um, uh, try to see how can you imagine or how can you plan a bypass surgery without saphenous vein graft? How can you do it off pump and on pump? Which type of medication you should receive after you perform an all arterial bypass grafting? What are the current evidence uh, when you use a radial or when you use a right internal thoracic artery? And finally, again, more debate uh, about the evidence basis uh, for multi-arterial bypass grafting and the use of uh, radial artery and internal thoracic artery for uh, the different type of targets. And more than uh, going into the barrel of Rita versus right uh, uh, versus yes. radial, we have tried to promote the concept of uh, get to know which conduit uh, you uh, uh, you have available for your own patients and tailor the type of surgery around the patient needs, around the patient's anatomy, around the patient's characteristics. So try to promote the concept of multi-arterial uh, uh, revascularization independently from uh, which conduit uh, you like to use or you are more common to use. Yeah. So, John, look, at that's absolutely correct. And I think, however, what the abstracts also do in addition to that is they try to cover every aspect of coronary artery surgery. So it's not simply talking about off-pump or the use of multiple arterial grafts, which are crucial to the performance of coronary surgery. But we've looked at a lot of different abstracts who are exploring different areas of coronary artery surgery. So we've tried to make this program as broad and as deep as possible to make sure we're reflecting all the great investigations and studies being done in different areas of coronary artery surgery from groups around the world. And I think it, it bears a mention that this is not an off-pump bypass uh, curriculum. This is a coronary bypass curriculum. Uh, all of the organizers recognize that the majority of coronary surgery performed in the world is per performed with the benefit of uh, the heart-lung machine. And, and so it's focusing on improving all of the aspects of coronary surgery by every technique that is used. That's the mission of the uh, International Coronary Congress. So the curriculum spans off-pump and on-pump, open and minimally invasive, robotic and non-robotic, uh, all arterial and vein. We want you, if you're going to use veins, we want you to harvest them perfectly and, and deploy them perfectly. If we're going to use arteries, we want to have the same uh, excellent harvest and excellent and, and, and thoughtful deployment of the vessels. And then, of course, we want to have the surgical assistants in the operating room supremely skilled to, to do that. And then the perioperative care providers um, uh, carrying the ball across the, the goal line, if you will, uh, by, by providing great perioperative care to get those outcomes that we desire for our patients. Can Correct. we quickly ask Richard what he, I think he alluded to do it earlier, but where does Richard see the program really progressing compared to what we did before? Um, thank you, Dr. Taggart. Um, I, I think that um, th there are so many different aspects to uh, coronary surgery and uh, taking a look and having some really fruitful discussions on what we can put together as a platform in the future uh, is very exciting. So as far as endoscopic vessel harvesting, uh, which is uh, certainly the gold standard, it's, it's certainly not a question of uh, should we be doing it? It's, you know, how do we do it to have a greater quality outcome? You know, whether we discuss uh, the no touch technique or yes. um, how do you assess uh, the different patient populations and still have a good outcome? Uh, utilizing the radial artery and making that transition from vein to radial. Uh, these are all uh, currently being discussed and we keep reformulating the plans to make yes. it much more focused. Um, the perioperative care of the patient 
is a significant opportunity in which yes. we are delving into in, in this year's program. Um, but as, as, as you know, there are uh, ongoing discussions about the continued expansion of that. Um, and I do see uh, making um, increased opportunities for all the team members within our uh, conference available. And these platforms are coming forward. And, you know, the, the, the other aspect of this is we love to hear from you. You know, what would you all like to see in yeah. this conference going forward in other platforms, not just on an annual basis, but also as we go month to month moving forward? We'd love to be in constant communication and, and discuss ideas. Yes, let's please uh, request those chats that you can send in. I don't know that we're going to be able to respond to all of them in real time, but we're eager to hear feedback of how uh, you as attendees from around the world uh, would like to see us uh, fine tune the program or even radically change it. We're open to all sorts of innovative ideas um, uh, to continue uh, to contribute. Yeah. And can we also please hear from Shauna? about what she sees are the potential advantages of this program to a practical, clinically practicing nurse that doesn't already exist for the, the members of the nursing community. What do you think, where do you think, Shona, that this would be beneficial to a nurse working either on intensive care or in the operating room or on the ward? So basically something that we wanted to focus on is how equipment that is used in the ICU, how nurses can understand the theory of that equipment and how they are involved in managing that equipment to assist patients in progressing along. We also wanted to talk about the changing landscape of healthcare, how nurses are leaving the bedside and how we're utilizing ways to recruit and retain nurses. And two of those topics are something that we've traditionally never done is having new graduates come directly into the cardiac surgery ICU, yes. which is something that, you know, we've never really done because cardiac surgery ICU is very acute. It's very high stress. Yeah. There is a lot going on. It's different than a med surg unit. And one of the ideas that we've come up with this year, we've developed new fellowship programs and intense training that we have actually done this year as our first like beta test, where we took new graduates and we developed this intensive program and how they went through this intensive program. And they are actually doing very well in our ICUs and how we can share that with other people who are new graduates or if there are other struggling cardiac surgery programs who are unable to find experienced nurses. And, you know, obviously a lot of nurses go into CRNA school, they transition into MPs and they're not really staying at the bedside that much. So this is one program and how we did the fellowship in getting, we actually trained six nurses so far. We're planning on training more and how we can share that with other programs and also for people who are interested in cardiac surgery as nurses, but maybe are a little too timid to go that these programs do exist. We also, you know, for the retention piece, how we do shared governance. And that is where you'll see something with our unit practice council where nurses are actually, bedside nurses are actually leading how we do changes in the ICU. And it's just not just to the cardiac surgery clinical aspect, which is a part of that, but it's also about workflows and having a say in their unit, which can be very powerful. Yes. And, we actually have, and we actually have staff nurses who created our U unit practice council on the unit. They're gonna talk about all the things that they have done and how it's enriched and engaged them back into the unit. We also wanted to talk a little bit about complications. They do exist. And so we wanted to talk about how do we manage complications? One, how do we prevent them? But sometimes they do occur. And then how do we manage them through back to the state of health and wellness? And I mentioned previously about equipment, you know, balloon pump and pacemakers, and especially pacemakers, people kind of fear them a little bit. And nurses kind of take a more hands-off approach 
But I think after this um, lecture by Fred Zunau, who has uh, been a cardiac surgery nurse for over 30 years, once he shares and explains how you can operate a pacemaker safely, I think this will also help nurses from other programs take a more hands-on approach to equipment that maybe they were a little too, you know, hands-off to touch. Yeah. Yes. I learned myself uh, from uh, Fred, uh, Shona. <laughs> I think that's Fred literally right. true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fred has true. taught all of us. Hey, Fred has told all of us how to use properly a, 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 a pacemaker. So it's a really, it's a really, it's really the truth. In in in, in going back uh, to the main uh, to the main uh, um, to the main program, <laughs> I'm very happy and a little bit proud of have push uh, uh, all uh, uh, um, uh, the rest of the board meeting uh, to accept uh, for uh, one of the final uh, session uh, of Friday night uh, to introduce the concept of uh, intraoperative disaster in cap surgery. At the end, uh, you always go to this meeting uh, and you hear these uh, fantastic leaders uh, tell, tell, talking about uh, total arterial uh, K, Y, uh, T, anastomosis, uh, off-pump, uh, uh, minimal invasive or, or robotic. But then when sometimes happen and you have a complication, how you get the hell out of there. And I think that uh, mm -hmm. going to a meeting and come back home with some uh, real world uh, uh, um, trips and tricks uh, for how to solve problem or how to get out, uh, how to manage complications is extremely important because uh, as Shona was saying, they do happen. And the most important is how do we react to them and how we can stay on top of it. So we have asked uh, for uh, uh, the, the last session uh, in, in on Friday to talk about what happened in the case of dissection of your ITA. You don't have good flow. You just uh, take down an ITA or you were thinking about a anaortic uh, complete uh, 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 ITA dependent uh, bypass grafting, what to do in that case, which ITA should be used, which one should be saved, which one you should say no, just uh, put a vein or put something else or harvest the uh, right internal thoracic artery. Again, uh, malperfusion and stealing uh, is another big, big uh, theme uh, you 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 complete finally and you are all proud of your complicated and sophisticated y graft uh, and suddenly your ttfm is telling you that there is the most of the blood is going to the om and not to the led and that's a bad day and it's already 2 p.m uh, and you have probably another case that day how to get the hell out of there safely and how to make sure that that patient does very well in long term Finally, on-pump and off-pump disasters, how to prevent them, how to control them, and what to do in case you have it. So this is uh, the concurrent session, disaster in coronary bypass grafting. And then we have uh, a day of Saturday. Dr. Pascas, tell us what is the major Saturday uh, uh, um, concept. Uh, we, we have dedicated basically the three major session here for uh, the uh, uh, low ejection fraction. Tell us a little bit what is the 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 the, the, the theme of the day. Yeah, this is a this is a very important uh, day. Of course, um, <clears throat> we begin with uh, preoperative imaging and functional evaluation in cabbage patients because we want to be very systematic and scientific in how we evaluate evaluate patients prior to coronary surgery, uh, and then we have a deep dive in into the surgical and perioperative management of patients who are undergoing coronary bypass. Uh, with a very low ejection fraction. Uh, as you know, uh, Gianluca, there's been a lot of interest in the use of um, various mechanical circulatory support devices, including the uh, surgical impella, the 5.5 impella, which is um, designed to be implanted by surgeons. Uh, and so this, um, th this technology um, and how it can be used to care for patients with very low ejection fraction, it, I think represents a real opportunity. Uh, so there's a deep dive into uh, all the different elements of coronary surgery in patients with low EF. You know, there's a there's a there's a tension between the realization that patients with little ventricular reserve and multivessel disease generally have the most to gain from surgical revascularization, and they can't tolerate multivessel stenting 
with an expectation of the same long-term benefit because if a gra if a stent closes, they lose what limited ejection fraction they still possess. And so outcomes in the longer term with PCI are worse than with cabbage. But getting the low EF patient through the cabbage can sometimes be challenging. And so that's what this whole session is about. Uh, and there's a, there's a focus on the, the, the concepts around um, uh, using mechanical circuitry support uh, for coronary patients. <clears throat> Correct. We, we then go to the lifetime achievement, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, David Taggart, and I put you back in stage here. What the lifetime achievement this year, tell us who is the recipient and uh, why we have decided to, to, to offer this, uh, this lifetime achievement to him. So great question, Gianluca. And by the way, also to make just a note on record, thank you for organizing these superb webinars it takes a lot of time and effort, and you've covered everything that we need to discuss. And to get towards the end by discussing the Lifetime Achievement Awards is a really great suggestion. So this year, John and myself, with the rest of the committee, thought long and hard who we felt deserves the Lifetime Achievement Award. And we've come up with two people, Professor Patrick Sirois and Professor Fred Moore, and most of the people on this webinar will recognize these names as the principal key authors of the syntax trial. And they did something that was extraordinary. Rather than doing a trial with highly selected patients, they enrolled patients who were quite typical of what was happening in everyday routine clinical practice. So they, they got they, they did not employ the previous tactics of 19 different studies of employing very highly selected patients who didn't really represent what was happening in everyday routine clinical practice. And the syntax trial, although now published more than 10 years ago, is actually still the most important, relevant, influential trial that's ever been done comparing PCI and cabbage. And most of our Listeners just now will be aware that the syntax trial came out very much in favor of bypass grafting over PCI in almost every category of multivessel disease. So we felt, and that, and that has a profound influence on what we do in routine clinical practice. So John and myself and the rest of the committee felt it was time to say that we should recognize what Patrick Sirois and Fred Moore did in establishing that trial and its immense relevance to current routine clinical practice. So we feel that it is time for the International Coronary Congress to actually recognize what they did. And Thank as, you, as Dr. Tech, yeah. as Dr. Tech said, it's, you know, Patrick Sirois, of course, uh, one of the uh, most famous, most famous international um, interventional cardiologist alive, and Fred Moore uh, was his surgical partner. They were a heart team when they designed the Syntex trial, and you saw that uh, the TBD next to Dr. Moore. Dr. Moore is not uh, well enough to travel. Unfortunately, he's had to withdraw from being physically present. But Dr. Uh, Patrick Sirois will be uh, with us in New York. Um, and he is the father of the syntax score. He created the syntax score, and it's with the analysis of the complexity of coronary disease by the syntax score that we appropriately assign patients to have PCI or cabbage or medical management. And so he is really truly a luminary in the field of coronary artery uh, disease and its management. Uh, and he will present on behalf of himself and Dr. Moore um, really kind of a combined double keynote address that discusses the Syntex trial, the concept of the heart team that went into it, but also something that he's developed since then, which is called the Syntex 2 2020 score. That is um, a calculation or algorithm that assesses and, and provides a prediction of the longevity of a patient with a particular kind of coronary disease or a particular Syntex score or pattern of coronary disease um, if that patient is assigned to have PCI versus cabbage. Um, and that, that's tremendously important. 
Another thing that Dr. Sorois has done since then, he's an extraordinarily productive individual. Uh, now, a, you would think a retired gentleman, but not at all. Um, uh, extraordinarily vigorous in leading uh, his clinical research group. Uh, and he will tell us about the fast track trial, which is the next giant impact on coronary disease. And this is a trial uh, which he has been the author of and which I have had the opportunity at Mount Sinai, um, a Morningside Hospital to be the only North American enroller. This trial random uh, allowed patients to who are um, being referred for coronary surgery uh, to have the operation performed with the guidance of only a coronary CT angiogram and CT FFR. No visualization, no viewing of a coronary angiogram or conventional angiogram by the surgical team uh, doing the operation. So patients had patients were referred for cabbage, typically with an angiogram. The operating team did not see the angiogram. The patient was enrolled in the trial, then had a CT angio and CT FFR. And the CT angio and CT FFR are used as CAT scan only, used to design, design the operation and conduct the operation. And then a month later, the patient has another CT uh, and CT FFR to calculate a residual syntax score. And that, that paper is in press, not yet published. Um, but Dr. Sorois will tell us about that trial. Obviously, it will eliminate the role of the interventional cardiologist as a gatekeeper in the management of patients with coronary disease. So this is a, a truly landmark trial, and he's going to talk to us about that at some length uh, at this year's ICC. Fantastic. Excellent uh, really layout. We will have a two more session on the day of Saturday uh, 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 that will, will involve uh, CABG in, uh, uh, with atrial fibrillation and uh, CABG uh, also with uh, how to read a TTFM properly, uh, what, uh, how to use the TTFM in the operating room. And finally, we have uh, two sessions, one on, uh, on, on uh, Saturday night and one on uh, uh, Sunday morning uh, about ERAS in coronary artery bypass grafting. The concept, uh, again, uh, as underlined by Shauna before and Richard, is not all about uh, how, we, how many stitches you pass in your coronary anastomosis, but it's also the good, well, taking care of patients uh, has a lot or even more to do than the surgical technique about how the patients is care after the surgery. What happened? What, how can we stratify the risk? Are the conventional restriction that we place on patients who receive a sternotomy, like to not driving for four weeks, uh, where do they find the fundamental from? Should we change the paradigm? Should we offer patients a different perspective to go back to their normal life in a more uh, fast track? And again, uh, rehabilitation, anesthesia, and pain management. And all of these elements will be discussed during these ERAS uh, uh, focus days. Uh, again, one for uh, 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 Saturday and one on uh, Sunday morning after the event of a, a, a rapid abstract session. And here is the second, the second day of ERAS. Finally, we go to an interview and a live, uh, living legend. Talk, uh, Dr. John Pascas, tell us a little bit uh, about George Green and Bruce Lytle, why we invited and, and uh, what, what to expect. So this is an opportunity that literally um, will not come again. Uh, George Green performed the first internal mammary artery graft to the LED in North America uh, in 1968. Uh, and he is still alive here in New York City. Uh, Bruce Lytle, uh, of course, needs no introduction, uh, arguably the most famous living coronary surgeon, um, past chief of uh, cardiac surgery at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. These two gentlemen, George Green was literally around and participated actively in the very, very earliest days of coronary surgery on planet Earth. And Bruce Lytle uh, was maybe half a generation younger or a decade younger. Um, you know, George is in his 90s, Bruce in his 80s. Um, and these two gentlemen literally um, made coronary surgery what it is today. We're going to have an hour to simply talk to them 
uh, about what it was like uh, to create the field of coronary surgery and to live in it uh, during the harsh early days when not every when we didn't have a 0.7 percent mortality rate. And how did they innovate in that setting? What were the constraints? What were their experiences? Uh, they're both um, great speakers, uh, very interesting and 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 a charming uh, gentlemen. Uh, we're going to videotape this as well uh, because we think this is a conversation for posterity. And I believe, frankly, this will be the single most fascinating part of this entire meeting. Completely agree. Finally, we will go through, again, some uh, minimal invasive and robotic, uh, and uh, we will go uh, a, a topic uh, that I, 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 I deep care for. And uh, concomin concomitantly, we will present uh, more abstract uh, for the plenary session. And uh, 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 we will have, uh, finally, a five minutes video masterclass. Uh, Dr. Taggart, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about this concept uh, so we can wrap it up uh, and wrap up uh, this, uh, this closing uh, uh, events uh, of the ICC 2023. So thank you, Jan Luca. So the, the the purpose of this last part of the program, so much of the program discusses not only how to do things, a lot of it is based on the evidence basis of why we should be doing things. But what we want to do in this last session is actually show people how do you do it? So we're, this is not going to be concentrating anymore on the theoretical reasons why you should be doing it. These are going to be very practical videos for people wanting to say, OK, I've heard the evidence basis, but how do I actually do this? So this is designed to be a very practically orientated session. And we hope and we believe many of the delegates will be very interested to see these videos being performed by people who are experts in that area. Superb. And, uh, and, and we want to the high quality videos for all of those residents uh, and, and uh, uh, young attending to learn uh, and to uh, um, become uh, really acquainted with, uh, with new techniques and technologies. And this is, will be the last uh, session before the closing remark. And, and the announcement, uh, as we said, of the 2024 meeting in London. Just to close, I want to thank everybody today to have joined us. Uh, uh, I want to especially thank Dr. David Taggart for being awake now at one o'clock in the morning in Sydney. And uh, 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 really, kudos to you. Chad, look at the night is just starting in, to, in um, Sydney. So there's a lot to do yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, worried also, about it. <laughs> thank right. you, thank you very much. As I sign off, can I also very much thank Richard and Shona for their great contributions? Because there's no questions; they have significantly enhanced the quality of this meeting, and it will become a very permanent feature of this meeting. I would also like to thank you for the in, immense efforts you've put into not only being part of the program of ICC, but publicizing it in a way with expertise on social media that certainly John Puskas and myself do not have. Um, so your efforts are immensely appreciated. And also, I'd like to say to my great friend and colleague, John Puskas, that we've been, with whom I've been working for well over 10 years now, it's still a great pleasure and privilege for me to keep doing this with him. I think, so the team that we've got here on this um, screenshot just now, I think is all working together, have really created and enhanced the program that is now without doubt the best program for coronary artery revascularization worldwide. And that's not to discredit or be negative about AATS, STS and EX, who are also doing their kind of efforts on coronary surgery but i think the team we have in front of us have really made great strides in creating something that is simply unparalleled fantastic i don't think we we, we need to add any more words other than come in new york city december 1st to december 3rd 2023 join us connect uh, we also want to see who is behind uh, all of the views that uh, every 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 month or every other month we do with this live talk we want to make sure that we uh, uh, stay together uh, and, and network uh, in real life uh, 
and uh, get to know each other. Thanks again and have a great Saturday morning or Sunday night according to your time zone. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night, Thank guys. You.